Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Building the Foundation for a Successful Fundraiser. Uh, we got a ton of information that we're going to be sharing with you today here, as always. Uh, we love doing these webinars and we're so glad that all of you decided to join us here today. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Couple housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute throughout the broadcast. Uh, we're not going to be distributing the slides, but we will be distributing a recording on YouTube that you can watch at any time and share with your team. In fact, we hope that you share with your team, uh, just because there's going to be so much valuable insight uh, that we present here today. And you know, for that matter, if, uh, we may go a little bit over the allotted hour time slot. So if you can't stick around for the whole thing, don't worry. Uh, all is not lost. We'll be sending that recording, and you can watch it. Uh, anytime you please. So uh, if you have to leave at some point, don't worry. Again, we'll be, uh, we'll be sending out that recording so you can watch it. If you have any questions, we definitely, definitely want to hear it. Uh, we, you know, some one of the best parts about these webinars is hearing from you guys and the questions that you have about running your events. So uh, please type them into the little questions pane you'll see on the GoToWebinar panel uh, down towards the bottom. It says questions. Uh, go ahead and type your question in there at any time during the broadcast, and we'll get to it during a Q&A session at the end, which always promises to be beneficial. You can I'm at WinspireMe or at SR Auctioneers using the hashtag Fundraiser Foundation. Our guest today, as uh, you know, not a first-time guest, some, someone who's been with us for for some time now, one of our favorite auctioneers here at Winspire, uh, Scott Robertson. He's a uh, one of the most successful auctioneers in the country, out of Naples, Florida. Welcome, Scott. Well, thank you, man. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I know you've heard me say this before, but I just think it's so great that Winspire is putting the effort and resources in to being able to get good information out to people uh, about fundraising events. I think it's just fantastic, and I applaud Winspire's efforts. I appreciate that, Scott. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's what we love doing. I mean, so much of this uh, space is all about is is you know learning how to run these events more effectively because it can be the the difference between uh, thousands tens of thousands of dollars raised for your organization and so uh, it's really important to us that people people learn and people uh, we share the information as much as possible my name is Ian I'm the vice president of fundraising here at Winspire and I love uh, hosting these things for you guys out there so uh, excited to get going uh, before we do just wanted to give Scott a quick opportunity to share uh, share a little bit about himself and what he's been able to accomplish. There's some pretty impressive numbers up here, Scott. Well, they are, and you know, they come because of a lot of hard work by a whole lot of people, and I've been very fortunate to uh, be involved in some really higher end uh, fundraising events. I select about 70 events to work a year, me and my associate, Sarah Rose Bittner, and uh, we've, you know, the last six years, the proof's in the pudding. We've helped raise a little over $149 million, which of course we're planning on getting to uh, to 150 before the year's out. That's fabulous. Some great numbers, Scott, and I applaud you, my friend. Uh, we're, we're not quite up there yet, but uh, we do, do still try to contribute to our uh, nonprofit clients out there. Uh, our experiences, for those of you who don't know, we, we provide un unique no-risk uh, travel experiences for your live and silent auction. Uh, we've been in over 44,000 events globally. We've uh, taken over 85,000 satisfied winning bidders and sent them around the globe on these experiences. And the experiences themselves have, have helped raise over $50 million for nonprofit causes since 2008. And uh, we love seeing that number continue to climb. Uh, just real quick before we get into the meat of, of the uh, webinar here, for those of you who are not familiar with Winspire and, and how it works, what no risk consignment travel really means, uh, it's free to reserve for your fundraising event. You can uh, select any one of our two over 200 unique experiences for your event, promote it to your audience, and offer it in your auction. You can sell it any one of them as, as many times as you can. That's a really good way to amplify the amount of revenue you make on each of those items, and then you keep all proceeds above the nonprofit cost. If you're interested in learning more, please check out our catalog at winspireme.com or give us a call. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Here's an overview of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, we've split it into four sections, and it's all about building the foundation, right? Building a, uh, a, a fundraising event that's not going to just be one year in the making. It's going to be over the course of five or even ten years, uh, really getting those, those strong pillars in there. And uh, we're going to start by talking about creating a sustainable event. 
right? And then talk about thinking strategically and in the long run. Uh, and then we're going to dive into the live and silent auction. We're going to start by talking about the scope of your silent auction and then talk about procuring the items for your live auction. So let's get to it. Ah, I was for, I almost forgot. I would like to start these things with a little poll of the audience to see kind of what sort of events you guys are, are running out there. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask, what is the typical audience size uh, or attendance for your fundraising events? Uh, you'll see a little poll pop up on your screen. You can answer it's less than 100 guests, 100 to 250 guests, 250 to 500 guests, 500 to 800 or 800 or more. Uh, we'll keep it open here just for a few more seconds. We have about 70% of everyone voted. Give five more seconds. Three, two, and one. All right, let's share those results. Great. This is this is very typical of what we see out there. Um, you know that kind of most events are going to be between that 250 to 500 guest range, uh, with you know kind of the runner-up being between 100 and 250. What do you what do you think about this, Scott? Well, that's kind of what I find an awful lot too. Some of it depends upon the size of the venues that you have to work with. You know, there's not a lot of uh, rooms that'll hold 800 plus. Um, but that's 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 what I find, and you know, interesting enough that the different levels, those levels are. I treat each one of those levels differently as a fundraising auctioneer. Uh, right. You know, my mannerisms are different. How I approach the event is different. So it's uh, ironic that you came up with the exact numbers that I want to know uh, when I approach the event. That's great. Well, a lot of the topics we're going to be talking about today are going to be able to apply no matter how many guests you have at your event, but it's, it's good to know that there is different strategies you can employ for each. Uh, we have one more poll I wanted to get to here. Uh, what, how many live auction items do you typically include in your live auction? Uh, or maybe you don't have a live auction. And if, if you don't, then go ahead and select that first one. You don't have live auctions. Uh, do you have one to four items, five to seven, eight to 11? or 12 or more items in your live auction. We always like to ask this because there's such a wide range of opinions on this, uh, I've found, in terms of you know what people think are, are the best routes to go. So we have about 75% of you voted. We're gonna keep it for three more seconds. Two and one. All right. Interesting. Okay, great. We have a really even split amongst all the all the different items, and we have a lot of people who have just silent auction items out there, which is great because we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about uh, silent auctions. Um, but that's pretty interesting. Or maybe they're there. Wait, maybe they're wanting to learn today how yeah. to uh, incorporate a live auction into their fundraising event. Absolutely, which we always recommend. Um, simply because live auctions tend to uh, get those kind of bigger dollar amounts uh, for for less effort. But um, yeah, that's it's a pretty interesting distribution. It's it's kind of all over the place, which um, which which can fit depending on the audience size. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more today about how many items uh, is ideal uh, depending on the audience size. Thanks for sharing that, you um, folks. Let's go here. All right. Oh. And um, Thanksgiving was last week. I uh, hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with friends and family. Um, Scott, I know that you had an interesting story that you wanted to share today before we got started. Well, I do because I think it applies. It was about Thanksgiving dinner, but I think it applies to fundraising events as well. So picture, if you will, uh, and this was about a week before Thanksgiving, and a new, new couple had moved into the neighborhood, uh, both engineers, both fresh out of college, both, you know, I mean, obviously, newlyweds, and all this, the family decided it would be great for Kim to host Thanksgiving dinner for their family. That means 18 people. And Kim, being the trying to get along with everybody person that she is, said yes. And then about a week before it happened, she realized that she really had no clue what she was doing. And she was lamenting to my wife, who has some experience uh, of what was going on. She goes, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. People are asking what to bring. I have no clue what to do. So my wife says, let me help. So she sat down with Kim. They developed a menu. They structured a timeline for meal preparation. They figured out the seating arrangement, and because of Mary's guidance and them taking a few moments, you know, a half hour, an hour, to be strategic about how to do it, the meal went off without a hitch. It was great. 
That's great. And how I think that applies to fundraising events is without Mary's help, would the meal have happened? Yes. Would it have been okay? Yeah, it would have been okay. But would it have been as good as it could have been had she not had good advice? I find a lot of fundraising auctions do that as well. You know, they say, well, we did the best we knew how to do. But they weren't strategic about what they were doing. And yes, every dollar they raised is one more dollar they didn't have. However, could it have been more? I think our story today uh, and what we're going to be working on in the webinar is thinking about fundraising events and thinking about them from a strategic basis, not just from a run forward, collect as much stuff as you can, sell it for as much as you can, and say, wow, we did it. Well, that you totally, did, but did you do it as well as you could have? That that makes a lot of sense, Scott. And um, it's yeah, and we'll talk a lot today about being strategic and very intentional and deliberate about the actions that you take before, during, and after the event uh, to make sure that yeah, you're making the most of it. Because it's not very often that you have all of your VIP donors in one room together, and uh, you know it's based on your steps taken before and during, it can make the difference between an okay event and one that really just knocks it out of the park. So that's, that, I think it's a really applicable story. Uh, thanks for that, Scott. Great. So let's get into it. Creating a st sustainable event, right? And this is all about because many times people are concerned about just that first year of money, right? if, especially if it's your first year event, what's going to happen? You aren't really thinking beyond and uh, thinking down the road is, is what is going to really start to happen. Uh, so let me start by asking you, Scott, what do you think is the biggest problem that first-time events have to overcome? Well, it just piggybacks on what you just said, and I think it's taking the time to strategically build an event. Notice I didn't say create, I said build. You build an event step by step, block by block, and force it up and bring it up from there. And what they often do is they focus on the money first instead of thinking about how they're building an event that is going to be sustainable. It's just, wow, we need the money now. Let's get as much money as we possibly can. And if they would focus on building the event, the next two, three, four, five years is going to be so much better than if they just go for the money at the beginning. If you've ever tried to learn to play tennis or golf, I can tell you, because I have, I can tell you, if you'll spend your time getting lessons on how to strike the ball and not play in the game, you're going to be a much better player a lot quicker. Is it as much fun as just going out there and trying to score? Probably not, but in the long, in the big picture, it's the smart thing to do. Develop your game first, then go play it. I like Develop it. your event first, and then execute. I love that, and a lot of that's about breaking it down into manageable pieces, right? And not just focusing on the dollars, but focusing on all of the things that surround that to make a, an event successful. Uh, one one thing I you first talked about when we started putting this webinar together, right, is the difference between ideas and traditions. And I, I picked this picture because I thought it was hilarious about <laughs> traditions that, that can actually uh, take a mind of their own, right? <laughs> yes, and while it's really fun and it's really great, you can tell by your – there's going to be some pushback in a couple of years from that. And you have to be really careful when you start off with an idea because when you do it the second time, it has become a tradition and you have a hard time unwinding those traditions. And I bet in our listening audience today, uh, they could all write down – in fact, I encourage you to do so – write down three traditions at your fundraising event that you wish – would go away. Go ahead, do it right now. Write them down. What are three things that you wish would go away that you hadn't inherited? Huh. Yep, I see the pencils moving quickly. <laughs> well, yeah, and as far as those traditions go, right, how do you go about removing them? Well, when you go about removing them, you've got to be very strategic there as well because somebody's had who's the person whose idea it was, they suddenly become it becomes their sacred cow. So you've got to be careful not to just come in and make wholesale changes because you can really tick a lot of people off. If you're going to tick people off, tick them off in small groups and explain why you're doing it. Um, but, you know, a lot of people – they do a lot of things. They name things incorrectly. They, but we've always done the special appeal, fund and need. We've always done that last. Well, that's right. the wrong time to do it. But right. that's the way we've always done it. 
and right. you just have to get around that. But I will encourage you to do this. Don't make wholesale changes the first year. Pick three items or four items and change those. And the next year you get your next few items to change. And before you know it, you've evolutionized the whole event. But to, you know, pick your battles wisely. I like it. And uh, try not to establish them to begin with. That's great. One, yeah, one tradition that I know is it's extremely hard to break is uh, this difference between throwing a party and hosting a fundraiser. Yes, happens all the time. You know, it's especially prevalent with school auctions, I find, is they want everybody to come, so they throw this party. And, oh, everybody expects a big party. And that's what you end up with is that you're focused on the party, not the fundraiser. Then you have people uh, slightly inebriated, and you're trying to get them to focus on fundraising, and they don't want to have any part of it. They're having fun. Well, it's important that people have fun, but they have to have fun while being focused on fundraising. And that's another reason to do your fundraising early because if people are going to hit that alcohol bell curve, we want to hit it earlier versus later. But be very careful about establishing a party with a fundraiser as opposed to a fundraiser with a party. That will be a tradition that is really challenging to break. Fabulous. Let's take a step back here and, and kind of approach it from the way you consult uh, events. The first time you are um, approaching an event uh, and during your initial consultation, what are the things that you ask and, uh, and are looking for? Yeah, when I get called into events uh, for the first time, I want to know the things that are on the screen. And I kind of specialize in taking existing events that have, that have more potential. Uh, and they call me in to consult and to do the auction for events that are that have a lot of potential to grow. So the things I want to know, which are su probably going to surprise people, but I want to know their timeline first and foremost. If you've heard the other webinars that have, we've been able to do with Windspire, you know how adamant I am about timeline and how critical it is to the success of your event. Second thing I want to know about is the auction items. What did you have for auction items and what were the prices that were achieved? Primarily, I want to make sure that we're getting the auction items that match your audience. And by looking at that list, I'm usually able to just tell, you know, were the items too expensive? Were they not good enough? What was going on? Uh, that will tell me a whole lot. And then I want to know the revenue that was generated by everything. Uh, the last year and the previous year, and I want that broken down by categories, uh, sponsorships, ticket sales, all that sort of thing. I want to see where the income's coming in because that's going to tell me where you have potential for more. And then, of course, I want to know the number of people uh, of and who attended. Were you getting the right people there? Now, when I say who, I mean was it board members? You know, was it their friends? How how are you positioned within your local community? And then ticket price. One of the things about ticket price is that a lot of first-time events make the mistake of they want to put the ticket price low enough so they think everybody will come. And they put the ticket price actually below what it costs to host the event. So, well, if we put the ticket price low, then people will come and they'll spend more money and we'll get that money back later. Don't mm -hmm. kid yourself. No. Nope. Don't kid yourself. That's not going to happen. Charge enough money so that there, you've paid for everything, and there's a little bit of a profit margin. Doesn't have to be much, but charge enough that you're going to be able to get uh, that you're going to be able to cover all the cost. And realize this: you think you're doing everybody a favor the first time because you price because let's say it costs seventy eight dollars to host the event, so you sell the tickets for fifty. Next year, when you up those prices. A ticket prices to be able to cover your event and let's say you move them up to $75 now we're still not covering the cost of the event we're losing three dollars for every ticket wait till you see the pushback you get for that $75 mm -hmm. what you my goodness that's you know that's a huge increase I'm on a you I just and you'll get all kinds of pushback better charge them a hundred dollars and then you're able to stick with that price for a little bit longer. I mean, that being that if the um, if the cost for hosting the event is $78. Never lose money on ticket prices and realize one of the hardest things to do is increase ticket price. Right. That's, great. That's a tradition you want to av avoid at the beginning. That's great. And uh, a note on all these things, if you're not tracking 
uh, information on all of these things year over year, you should be, right? I, your timeline oh. should be tracked down to the minute as far as the way it's planned and then also the way it actually went, how, like how many minutes over each section went. T tracking auction items, what the prices were, what the value was at, what they achieved, what the revenue was generated from the silent and then from the live, from sponsorships and then from ticket sales, and then tracking you know, who these people are that are coming to your events, what are their professions, what are their job titles. All of this is crucial information and if Scott's going to come in, he's going to be able to give you much better advice or even someone like Scott, right, a different benefit of auctioneer, but Scott's obviously the best, but if <laughs> Scott's going to come in and uh, he's going to be able to make much more informed uh, and give you more informed advice if you're able to show him this information. Yeah, Jerry Maguire said, show me the money. Scott Roberts and the auctioneer says, show me the data. There I can go. work with data. Love it. All right, moving right along here. I know um, a lot of people have questions about selecting the right date. Oh, and we can go on forever about selecting the date, but just a, f a few things that are important. Uh, one is don't try to compete with established, established heavyweight events. Uh, you're going to lose. You are not going to win. That's just simply not going to happen. Uh, if you're big into sports, uh, look at the calendar a year out and make sure that there isn't a home football game or there's not a basketball game that's going to appear on that time. So be very cautious of that. The other thing I want you to think about with selecting an event date, Saturday is a big night, yes, but your event does not have to be on a Saturday night. There are six other nights of the week that can also work. Saturday nights, there's a higher expectation of entertainment. There's a higher expectation of being a little more grand. Uh, if you can do Friday, Sunday's work, just start everything an hour earlier. Uh, there's lots of nights of the week besides Saturday. But mostly, look at your social calendars. Look at your historic calendars when you select a date. Because realize, whatever date you select, if you're normally the second Friday in February, that's the date you're probably going to be having 10 years from now. So pick right. your date wisely. I've been going to a few events recently that were on Thursdays, actually, which I, I thought were really good. End of the week, people are starting to unwind, but people don't get as drunk on a Thursday as they would on a Friday. Uh, but people still are, you know, feeling the weekend a little bit. So uh, I, I recommend that too. Oh yeah, Thursday nights are great nights. I do a lot of events on Thursday nights. Great. Moving right along, recruiting your team. Yeah. Uh, recruit a team of doers. Don't say who would like to be on the committee. To heck with that. You know, if I were uh, going to create a volleyball team or a softball team, am I going to ask who wants to play or am I going to say who can I put on my team first and make a strategic effort to recruit people that I know can do the job? You do the same thing with auctions. You have one point person, likely that's going to be you, the person who's listening right now, and get a team of doers on board. You might have to take some volunteers that aren't the best, but make sure you have a team of doers because when it's all said and done, you can't be the person who's doing all the tasks. Recruit a team of, of doers, people that are well connected and have the ability to make things happen, and roll with it. There's you can have a committee of five get more accomplished than a committee of 30 if you have five doers. Love it. So recruit your team wisely. That's great. Establishing a budget, I know this is a big piece that people kind of don't necessarily dedicate as much time as it deserves, but budgeting is crucial. Oh, if you don't have a budget, how do you know what you're going to spend where? I mean, this is one of the first meetings is to figure out what your budget should be. Uh, we've, I see your great graphic here. We've got entertainment, auction, venue, food. When you look at that, I can tell you three of those cost you money. One of them makes you money. Right. You know, so invest in, get your return on investment in what's going to make you money. Now, do you have to have all four? Of course you do, uh, of some form or another, but just be real careful. And you'll see a line down there that says, don't let the decoration committee hijack the budget. They're famous for that. They're <laughs> throw, what you're doing is you're setting people up to throw a party that they don't have to pay for. Right? And they'll go crazy with right. flowers and decoration and everything. Folks, decorations are wonderful. They help the event. They are nice. You'll never have any trouble getting people on the decorating committee. But when it's all said and done, it doesn't make you any money. 
So be very careful and keep them on a strict budget. The only way they don't stay on a strict budget is if the person who's in charge of the decorating committee says, I'll pay for everything. Then you can let them do whatever they want. Right. You can always secure an underwriter and uh, get someone to de underwrite the decorations and then let them have at it. I love that tip. But you, you have to be thinking like a business here, right? Uh, you got to be thinking about, you mentioned it there, return on investment. And you want to be focusing on the things in your event they are going to actually generate cash. That's just such a key point. Absolutely. And this is something I mentioned kind of early on, right? Especially when you're building the foundation, you're not just focusing on the dollars that are going to be generated at the event. This is a huge opportunity for you to develop your donors, right? Really building that relationship. Uh, Not-for-profit organizations oftentimes find the way that they secure new people to their organization is they came to a fundraising event first and they kind of tested the waters. They looked around. They put their toe in the water. They got to learn more about the organization. It became the, fly, the mousetrap, if you will, to recruit people in. Um, if you ask most uh, development directors, they'll say, oh, I don't like fundraising events. I'd rather just get people to write a check. Well, of course, there's not nearly as much work and uh, it's a lot more cost effective. However, where do you locate those people? And you have to realize that it's part of the cost of doing business is to uh, develop your audience and get people in and get them to get their friends in. So make sure that all your, that your event is always poised as a donor cultivation event. Totally, and there might be someone who comes, you know, first time they might even come to two or three events and maybe spend, uh, they might be a very low impact donor on your, on your, you know, the attendance sheet for three events and then one year, all of a sudden, they feel like, okay, I want to dedicate everything I have to this one cause and all of a sudden they're a VIP donor and they're spending five, six thousand dollars in the live auction. You just never know, right? So you want to make sure that every piece of your event, there's so much that it's still, focused on the, the mission and informing and talking to people as if they are, are you know, they need to be informed, right? Yeah, and, and just to touch off topic, that couple that walks in that no one seems to know and nobody really goes over and talks to them, dude, they could be your big donor and you don't even know it. Don't let anyone stand by themselves and stand in a corner. Have a welcoming committee that goes over and learns about those people. Especially early in the event, right? Especially early in the event, don't let it. Don't let allow them to be the new kid in school. And they're not going to be. They might not be wearing a tux and a, a elegant ball gown, right? They might uh, be very unassuming, right? Never assume that you right. you know make assumptions about f people. Absolutely, make it as inclusive as you can and treat it like it is a, an audience development donor cultivation event for sure. Because if they went to the trouble to be there that night, to buy the ticket, to schedule the time, to be there that night. They've got motivation. Right. We just have to discover what it is. Board involvement. I know this is everyone's favorite topic. Uh, getting the board on board to do your bidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, the three G's of board involvement. They need to give, they need to get, or they need to get off the board. Part of a board requirement, and I have sat on numerous, of numerous boards, is a fundraising component. If your board, and some people are going to be nodding their heads here in a minute, if your board wants someone else to do the fundraising, bring them the money, and then they sit on high and decide how that money should be spent, they are the wrong people on your board. They need to get their hands dirty. They need to get involved and not just be the purse and allow someone else to do the fundraising. They have to be involved. And I will tell you that those people who are attending your event, they're looking at the people on the board. The board loves, boards love to be recognized. They love to be important. They don't always love to give. But I will tell you that the people in the audience are looking at the board members to see how they are participating. Because if the board member's not participating, why do I want to participate? They don't even believe in what we're working on. It's the feeling that I have when I'm donating and they're not. So right. boards, get involved. There's, there's a lot of ways they can give, too. I mean, one of the biggest and most important parts about the procurement effort that happens for the live and silent auction is networking, right? And who in your community is going to be 
most poised to give you the networking uh, contacts that you need uh, to go procure those big items in your community, it's going to be your board, right? They're going to know the people, they're going to put you in touch with folks, and uh, that's going to really help you get those auction items too. So make sure they are actively involved in the procurement process. Absolutely, and I just want to point out, point out that the second G is get. If they right. give money, that's great. Maybe they're not in a position to give money, but they can get items or they can get donations. But they need to be actively involved in getting if they're not in a position of giving. And hopefully they're in a position to do both. Great. Timeline. I know this is a favorite topic of yours, and for those of you out there who who didn't join us earlier this year, for we had a three-part webinar series um, that I'll actually send out as part of a post as with the recording. We'll send some links. Uh, we actually broke it down into three parts: the the timeline of the silent auction, the timeline of the live auction, and the timeline of a fund in need. And uh, they're actually three hour-long webinars that I'll be sending out after this. But give us a, a Spark Notes version of uh, of what what you uh, what you recommend, Scott. Well, one, uh, one thing that's interesting was I was going to send uh, someone the timeline the webinars that we did, and they said, how long are they? I said, well, they're an hour apiece. She goes, oh, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I found that totally ironic. But anyway, one of the things that you have to do is just kind of like Kimberly did with her Thanksgiving dinner. You've got to construct a timeline with due dates leading up to the event. Then you know if you're on track. Of, of a procuring items, of making all sorts of decisions, but have a hard and fast deadline on that. And now we know, and believe me, if you do that, you will not be stressed out right before the event because stuff that got slipped through the cracks, things that didn't happen, you're going to be able to monitor your progress and your committee's progress all the way through. And if you treat those deadlines as really deadlines and due dates, you will have a much better event. There will be a lot less stress, and you won't feel like the one-person show who's have, who's seemingly having to do everything. That's great. Okay, we're going to move along here. I'm actually going to uh, skip this slide just because we're a little short on time, but make sure that your mission is at the forefront of everything that you do and all of your communication. Make sure people know why they're there at your event. It's such an important piece. Um, but there's so much more I want to cover that we're going to we're going to kind of skip over that right now because uh, this, this is a really meaty section that we want to talk about. It's thinking strategically. And uh, whereas before we're talking about building that sustainable event over many years, now how do you approach each problem to, to make sure that the, the thought process is strategic? And that starts with casting a big net. Right. And if there's money in the room, figure out a way to capture those dollars. Now, every event is different. Some There's a, a handful of really big people that have money to give. There's another group that has a moderate amount of money to give. And there's another group that ha they want to participate, but they don't have that much money to give. Make sure that your net that you're casting is going to be large enough that everyone is going to be able to participate. Now, every event is different, but we want everyone to participate because, remember, we're developing those donors as well because this year they may not have so much, uh, but and especially the youthful donors, but they're going to have money in the future. They're going to give that money to someone. We want it to be your organization. That's great. And I'm, we're going to reference this net uh, here down the road when we talk about the silent auction a little bit, about how important it is to uh, to really cast that net and not and not forego uh, those big dollars here. So to, as far as where that net goes, what are some of the components that you can uh, include in your event uh, to act as that net? Well, you probably keep hearing uh, and I uh, referring to everything as a fundraising event or an event. That's right. Most people call it fundraising auctions. It's not. A fundraising auction is one component of a fundraising event. So when we look at this, uh, we kind of narrowed it down to seven things. Sponsorships, you can see everything on there. Ticket sales. Uh, there's other additional revenue enhancers. You don't have to do everything. In fact, you probably don't want to do everything. Don't let any of the revenue enhancers, okay, and there's a lot of them out there, but don't let them sabotage your live auction and your special appeal. So Those be very strategic in what monies you're getting for people. Because if I give you $10 for raffle tickets, I hate raffles, by the way, but if I give you $10 <laughs> for raffle tickets and I feel like I've done my due, oh, you got me for $10. You should have gotten me for 100 So right, just be I, very strategic in which components you introduce. Don't introduce them all. 
Right, and I, I should have actually put these in order of, of what can potentially earn you the most. And the top three by far and away are going to capture the most dollars are going to be your live auction, your special appeal, and sponsorships, right? You talked about ticket sales covering the cost of the event. Sponsorships can go a long ways to making sure that, that ticket sales, um, you know, not only cover that but actually are profitable as well, right, covering various aspects of the event, whether it's the venue, the floral, the catering, uh, even auction items, right? We're seeing a lot of underwriters underwrite the cost of auction items, but those, those three big meaty ones, I should have put them at the top, live auction, special appeal, and sponsorships, that is where the biggest net is that you can uh, cast. The other things are going to be smaller nominal amounts that are still important because you want those uh, people to be able to participate, but it's not going to generate the sort of revenue that you can expect from the live auction, special appeal, and sponsorships. That's exactly right. And don't let the tail wag the dog. Don't spend so much time on the lower end stuff that you're uh, not giving enough attention to the higher end stuff. Talk to us a little bit about strategy there, Scott. All right. This typical strategy of a fundraising event, especially the first, uh, you know, the first year, is just go out there and knock on doors, knock on as many retail doors as you possibly can, get as much stuff as you can, bring it in here, and then we'll figure out a way to sell it. That sounds, and that is the easiest way to do it. You don't have to think. However, it's not effective, and the retailers are really tired of it, too. So before you go knocking on retailers' doors, form a strategic approach of what you're trying to do. Stop and think, and then go out. Don't, be, don't go out just like everyone else does. Be strategic. Here's an example about getting things donated. Let's say you're going to approach a high-end restaurant to donate dinner for four, or dinner for two. Go up to them and say, we're putting together an ultimate date night package, and we'd love to feature your restaurant. We've got XYZ limous, luxury limousine to give us six hours of limo time. We're working with Saks Fifth Avenue on getting us two $500 gift certificates for clothing, and we've secured tickets for the opera or perhaps a big concert. And then you look them dead in the eye and you say, we're seeking a high-end restaurant like yours to round out the package. And we would be grateful for a dinner with wine at your restaurant. What we've done there is we have packaged the deal and hopefully the restaurant is going to see value in being paired up with these other items. Okay, We didn't just go up to them and saying, hey, can you give us something for our auction? Well, what can I give you? Uh, here, here's a gift certificate for $100. Right. That's what they're going to give everyone else. Show them how they strategically fit into the package you're trying to build. You'll win a lot more often. Also, notice we're seeking a high-end restaurant, meaning if you don't donate, we're going to go to someone else. We just chose you first because... We have a relationship and we like you is what we're saying non-verbally. So that's one of the ways of getting things donated. And, of course, you did the same thing with the luxury, with the uh, limousine. You did the same thing with Saks, and you did the same thing with the opera. Right. And such, there's such a key part about this. It's, it's, it's the fact that you're strategizing, right? You're not just going out and asking. You, you are taking the time to go and, and with your committee brainstorm, come up with ideas for what, you know, what the packages are that you're going to want to create. And so much of this has to do with finding out what your audience wants and what they'd be interested. Most places, you know, you'll be able to create a date night type package and it'll be really popular. But there's many, many other things. Maybe your audience is, is uh, you know, you know everyone's really big fans of your local baseball team. Well, then you have to go find, okay, let's see if we can get people into the stadium uh, and turn on all the lights with no one in there and get one of the baseball players to come and, you know, have a cookout on the field, right? You come start coming up with the ideas, and then once you have the ideas, then you can form a strategic approach to actually go get those things. And it might not actually end the way that you initially intended it to, right? That, that package yeah. will morph over time as you go and try to package it together, right? The people that you contact, well, they'll come up with more ideas. Well, how about if we, what if we do this and this and this? Well, maybe we can't do that, but how about this over here? And this idea that you started with, you started with that strategic approach, will end with a with a still a beautifully big uh, extravagant auction item that you can sell for a whole lot more money than that hundred dollar gift certificate or tickets to the ball games, that sort of thing. 
Absolutely. And the other thing you want to think about is don't collect a whole bunch of stuff and then try to figure out how to put the things together. Be strategic before you gather that whole big bunch of stuff because you can put together packages that just don't make rhyme or reason sense too. So be strategic and you'll do much better at getting items. And as Ann said, they can sometimes morph into something that's even more powerful, which is really great, especially if that restaurateur says, hey, I've got an idea. Let's call in and away it goes. Right. Let's call in so and so. Oh, I know so and so. It's you know we can do a, a carriage or a horse drawn carriage or whatever. I know that I know several musicians who will come play a private concert in our restaurant. Uh, the you know the more strategic you are about your ask, the more things that are going to come of it. And the key is you're being different than everybody else that comes up and knocks on the door. Right. Right. You're setting yourself apart. And if you guys were um, here with our JDRF. Um, uh, webinar that we did a couple weeks ago. Uh, she talked about the same thing. You carry a very specific packet to each big donor or each big sponsor that is catered specifically towards them, uh, so they feel very special, right? They want to know that their donation is going to make a difference. And if you if you make them feel that way, they're they're going to be much more apt to donate. Now you're going to run into things uh, where you're you might actually have to spend money to create auction items, right? Uh, consignment is a, is a good example. You don't have to spend it, of course, but um, you, you only pay for the, the packages afterwards. But there, this is a perfect underwriting opportunity that we're seeing so many nonprofits do, and that's, that's get secure underwriters to actually go underwrite the cost of a travel package or some other live auction item out there. Absolutely. Let's say you're, uh, you're a doctor or a dentist, you know. <laughs> Um, you're a dentist. What are you going to do? Donate dental cleanings? Uh, donate maybe orthodontics? Something like that? That's never going to sell well at an auction. But if they can underwrite a package, they you know. So on the, in the uh, auction catalog, it says donated by you know A to Z Dental. Then they get the credit for donating the package. You get a great Winspire package. It's going to sell for way more than what they had to pay for it. It's a win-win situation for everyone. Because the dentist says, well, what do I have to donate? There's a perfect underwriting opportunity. I see it happen all the time. Dentists, lawyers, mechanics, uh, you know, the whole bit. That's great. And if, yeah, we could talk to you a lot more about uh, getting our packages underwritten. So if you're interested, definitely get in touch with us. Uh, but yeah, to finish this section about thinking strategically, why are some events more successful than others? And that is because they think strategically. I'm going to reference that. That JDRF webinar we did a couple weeks ago again, uh, every single part about running the 82 events that she does per year is absolutely strategic, right? About every ask, about every sponsorship request, about every single piece of their event, they're thinking strategically. They're not just kind of going out and doing it. Um, it's you're gonna you're gonna yield much better results. Did you want to say something on this, Scott? Well, it's just, you know, why are some football teams better than others? Do they have just have better players or was there a strategy involved? You know, when it comes right down to those last two minutes, I want Bill, Bill Belichick on my side because I know what a strategist he is. Also, Tom Brady's out there. I'm not a huge New England fan, but just so you know. But still, <laughs> they're going to be very strategic about what they do. They know what they're going to do, and if you'll take the time to – to think about, to plan, you will have a much better event and you'll actually do, accomplish it faster than if you just go out trying to shotgun approach. Always be a sniper. Be a sniper with everything that you do. One on one is what works. And remember, people give to people, they don't necessarily give to charity. So be strategic with that as well. Who makes the ask? Yep. Make it feel like it's a one-on-one -on -one ask, not like they're. That's why those donation letters that you send to, you know, hundreds of organizations or hotels. We do donation management for hotels, where they just get thousands of letters every single month asking for hotel stays. Well, they know that they're just replacing one or two words in the letter, right? It has to feel like a one-on-one -on -one ask, and people are far more, you know, likely to listen and sit down with you face to face uh, because you have been strategic about uh, the way that you ask them for a donation. Yeah, and they want to know the person who's making the ask is involved. Right, right. All right, moving right along here. Um, got about 15 more minutes, and uh, we're going to talk about assessing the scope of your silent auction. Sounds like there's a lot of folks out there that uh, do only the silent auction, but I know everyone out there probably has a silent auction component to your event, and it's really important to uh, to be very honest with yourself about how much return 
you're getting on the, the silent auction currently. Uh, tell us a little bit about your kind of philosophy, Scott, uh, regarding the silent auction. Well, one thing is for sure, you know, people load up their silent auction with anything that will be donated. Don't do that. Do not do that. Be strategic about the item. Be strategic about the items that you that you take in. Don't create a yard sale type format that is just so big, so overwhelming. People can't come in and look at it, and all they're looking for is to get a deal. If you have people looking to get a deal, you've created the wrong atmosphere. Okay, be more strategic than that. Reduce the number of items. Not to mention the fact that be careful because you've got so many items. You can spend an awful lot of time on silent auctions and get very little in return. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, it's better to combine packages and create, combine items and create packages that make sense. But don't accept junk or advertisements. And when I say advertisements, what I'm talking about is the photography studio that gives you a free uh, seating, you know, a, a free sitting rather. Uh, at, that's not a, a, a donation. That's an advertisement. They get the person to come in and get the pictures taken, then they upsell them and sell them a lot more stuff. Yeah, you can get those, you can get five of those to put in your silent auction. Don't do those. Don't do the karate studio. If they want to give you a membership for a year, take it. If they want to give you a one month membership, that's an advertisement. That's an advertisement. So don't do that. Right. And then another thing on this too, I mean, you can you can still accept these donations, but just you don't have to put it on the silent auction tables. You can also be strategic about which items you put out. And just because they donate something, you know, you can keep it and you can have a closet or room in your organization that's dedicated to uh, donations that we haven't used it. And you can use it for other things throughout the year, other smaller events, other donor cultivation events as incentives for your volunteers to go out and procure more and bigger, higher value items. So just because it gets donated does not mean that it necessarily needs to be on the silent auction tables. It's far more advantageous to have fewer high value items out there because you're going to get a much higher return. And that is because of the law of scarcity. That's right. Bigger packages, you're going to have fewer winners, but people are going to spend more. And I love this slide that says, fight for the last slice of pizza. We've all been there one way or another. That's what we want. We don't want to see five pizza boxes full of pizzas and we're no longer hungry. Now, all of a sudden, the value of that pizza is very little. But if that's the last slice and we're still hungry, that has much more value. So right. work with the law of scarcity, and you'll spend a whole lot less time, and you'll make more money. Another good way to put this is that is, and we talk about this in a great blog post. I highly recommend Googling uh, just Winspire Buyers Market or Auction Items Buyers Market or Silent Auction Buyers Market, um, and you'll read all. We'll, you'll go far more into depth into into this concept of, of supply and demand, and how exactly how many auction items you should have. Uh, in relation to the size of your audience. But what is a buyer's market? Uh, I think this picture uh, demonstrates it pretty well. It's There's so much to choose from that people are just going to go around and place one bid on every single sheet. If there's too many auction items, they're going to try to get that deal. Versus if there's the law of scarcity and there's not enough, uh, people are going to, it's it's a supplier's market. And they're they're going to want to go out and, uh, and be very strategic about what they bid on. So the buyer's market is the definition, offering more auction items than bidders during the event and our rule of thumb that we like to follow and, and Scott I think you have a similar one as well is is one item or less for every two buying units in the room what is a buying unit that means one wallet and typically that means a couple right it usually a husband and wife come and spend money together uh, on the live and silent auction so if you have 400 people come in uh, that the number of buying units in the room is 200 that means you have uh, 100 or less silent auction items on the table so that sound about right Scott well, it is, and you know, I tend to go for fewer items than that. I really want to create because I'm not the person that's going to go around and put my name on everything because I think it's a deal. I'm going to be the person that looks out, sees a hundred silent auction items, see my friend over there having fun, and I'm going to just get a cocktail and talk to my friends and avoid that uh, over, you know, a paralysis of analysis of looking at all the silent auction items. If there's fewer silent auction items, you're going to get me. Ideally, you want everyone who attends to look at every silent auction item at least once. That's True. ideal. If you've got 100, it's overwhelming. I just walk away from it. Right. So, so almost 50. 50 for 400 people is even uh, good. Yeah. 
right? Absolutely. Now, there's exceptions to the rules. If you've got a group that's a big consumers like schools, right, they're all buying stuff. I'm 56. I don't buy a lot of stuff anymore. Um, but it, maybe if they're consumers, then you have more silent auction items. But just make sure you don't have so many that you're driving the price down. We want to drive the price up. Right. It's all about creating bidding wars. And if there's not if it's not a lot of auction items to go for, people are going to end up bidding more. Fewer items, people spend more on those items. And another way to think about it, that I think this is great that you talk about, Scott, is thinking about the cost per item because it takes so much time and energy from you and from all your um, volunteers to put each and every silent auction item together, right? From inception, from donation to getting it onto the table, uh, there's a cost. Oh, there for sure is. And would that cause, would that volunteer and staff time been better off doing something different? So if you have a silent auction item and it's not going to generate $50, at $50 you're netting, you're net zero. People are like, oh, that's not possible. Yeah, well, follow a silent auction item along through its whole course and tell me if it didn't cost about $50. Best case scenario, a silent auction item gets touched nine times from the time it's picked up at wherever, whatever retailer you're picking it up from, typically, to the time it walks out the door with a, you know, with a, with a credit card payment, it, you've touched it at least nine times. I, I can just feel people nodding their heads, and sometimes it's more than nine times. Nine times is best case scenario. So just be real careful with that. Maximize, maximize, maximize. Time, max effort, yep. and money maximize your time effort and money that is so crucial it's so limited right so make sure you're getting the biggest bang for your buck and you won't burn out your volunteers right I, I know so many people who they choose not to do the event we have so much burnout and that's one of the things we battle here at Winspire all the time because every single year when we're trying to call and see if people want to use our items we're talking to new people because there's such a high level of burnout and so much of it has to do with the silent auction specifically Right? It's because it just took so much time and effort uh, to, to put it on, and then the return from it is just it's nominal compared to the thousands, tens of thousands of dollars you can raise in the live, inside, live auction in front of need. Absolutely. And securing spon sponsorship. Well, in fact, let's just pick it one more step in. Would you yeah. rather someone buy a $100 silent auction item right. or donate $100 during the fund of need special appeal? Absolutely, the fund of need. <laughs> right. It's easy. Nothing else has to happen. So if the person's only going to spend $100 and they think if they bought a silent auction item, giving $100 was that, or if they gave 100 in the special appeal, fund a need, I mean, make it easy. Make it easy for you. Make it easy for them. And 100% of what they donated goes directly to the cause you're trying to support. So uh, just keep that in mind. You're not, you know, all things are not equal at fundraising events. Totally, and we're not saying get rid of the silent auction by any means. It's a great, it's a great revenue generator during the cocktail hour before people sit down. But you can be so much more strategic about the way you approach it, and um, and the items that you actually put out. You can spend far less time and generate more money if there's fewer items that have higher value. That's that's. Yes. Pretty much the sum up right there. And I will tell you, if you put that on a spreadsheet, you're going to tell me, nope, that's not correct. Well, I'm telling you from experience, and Ian's telling you from experience, it is correct. Try it. You'll agree with us. Cool. We have uh, just a few minutes here. And, um, we're going to go a little bit over the 11 o'clock hour with question Q&A, um, so don't worry if you have to go, but uh, we hope that you stick around. Let's talk briefly about the live auction and procuring enough items. What is the sweet spot? Right. What is the amount of money that your group would want to spend for a live auction item? I mean, there's a, there's a spot there. I mean, and I'm just going to throw out numbers. I mean, is that number $1,000? Would that be a lot? Would it be $3,000? Would it be seven or 8000 10000 And we can go way up higher than that. But what is that sweet spot? Because if your group if the big spender is $3,000, that's, you know, that's where their comfort level is, don't try to sell them $7,000 items. You're not going to get them sold or they're not going to sell for very much. But if you know it's that $3,000 spot, then get items that will allow them to be competitive and in that $3,000 price range. But know your audience. You're going to hear me say that a hundred times, but know your audience and get items that meet the needs of your audience. 
And one of the things that you can do is ask your VIPs, the people that you know are going to support your cause, not necessarily the richest people in the room. Just because they've got money doesn't mean they're going to support the cause or spend money, does it? Everybody's nodding their head again. But ask your people that are supporters, what would they like to see in the live auction? And by asking them, now you're getting to hear from them what they might have interest in seeing, as opposed to just saying it's a big old world out there. And one of the things you want to do is you want to frame the question correctly. You want to ask them what they think, not putting them on the spot. If we got a trip to go fly fishing uh, in Canada this summer, would you bid on it? Well, now you've put them on the spot. And you uh, ask, you know, go ahead. No, I said, I would go, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> right, because now you've put me on the spot. But ask them, hey, we're thinking about getting a fly fishing trip to Canada to put in a live auction. What do you think? Then they'll tell you. They might tell you they're interested. They might tell you that their friend Fred has always wanted to do that. They might tell you, I think that's the stupidest idea in the entire world. <laughs> hey, but now you've gotten their opinion because remember, your opinion and my opinion aren't what's important. What's important are the people that are going to spend the money. And you can ask open-ended questions uh, and, you know, like, what have you seen at other events that you've liked? If we were to offer a trip to Napa, New York, or the tropics, which one are you most likely to bid on? Um, did you know, do you know anyone that might be interested? in a trip to Napa, New York, because birds of a feather flock together, right? The people that have the money that are going to do it. In fact, Ian, what, what's your favorite dessert? My favorite dessert? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I like, uh, well, let's just say tiramisu. Okay, tiramisu. Hey, Ian, we're serving uh, dessert tonight. Would you like apple or cherry pie? Oh. I'll go with cherry pie. Do you see how much easier it was because I narrowed the focus of the question? Right. right. Yeah. And will you be satisfied with apple with cherry pie? Yeah, totally. And I didn't make tiramisu. Right. So narrow down the question and help people to give you a better answer. What would you like to see in the live auction? Way too open ended. Right. Help narrow the questions down. Well, there's kind of like two sides of it, right? You want to ask, uh, you want to be specific and narrow, but you also want to ask, you know, uh, kind of open-ended questions when you're asking them what they think. So it's kind of like that, what's that saying? You know, you ask someone for advice, or you ask them <laughs> for money, they give you advice. You ask them for money, or advice, they give you money. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So right. ask people for advice. And ask them what they think the other people in the room would bid on. Oh, you know, I I, I know, you know, Chuck or, or Nancy were just, you know, they love uh, that fly fishing trip. Uh, you know, they, if you you just have to go out and ask the questions. You can't just sit here and guess what these people are going to want. You've got to start the conversation, and that they'll feel important and they'll feel like they're part of the planning process of the event. And uh, and and that's all about that's you're actually developing your donors. Yes, and how about this one? Well, we were at an event, and we saw Fred buy this fly fishing trip to Cuba, and Fred's, go, uh, and Fred's going to attend our event. Well, guess what he's not going to buy anymore? <laughs> he's not going to buy a fly fishing trip to Cuba. He already has one. He's right. out of the market. You've got to go after something else that will right. work. So. It's all part of your strategy, right? You got to think strategically, and, and you got to think about being informed, right? And and uh, you can send out a survey. There's free survey tools. You can send out emails. But the the best thing is doing that one on one. Take your donors out to lunch, right? Uh, get that one on one FaceTime, and and you know it can just be one part of your conversation in terms of what you know the, the auction. But then you can you branch it out into networking. Uh, you know, really thinking strategically about that procurement effort. And in bringing up the lunch idea, it's better. It's always better to take a, a couple of couples or a couple of people out so they can kind of bang ideas off each other. And it's not just one. When you make someone for an ask, do that one on one. When you're brainstorming ideas, get a few more people involved so that they'll ba bounce ideas off each other. And it doesn't have to be lunch either. You can just take them out for coffee. And right. People, people, people tend to love Starbucks, I hear. <laughs> That's the rumor. Right. Cool. This is the age-old question. I thought it was really important to uh, to cover before we wrap up here. How many live auctions items should there be? We had a, a wide range of, of answers in the very beginning. What would you say, Scott? 
I would say it totally depends upon how much time you want to spend in your fundraising event for the live auction. That's how I answer the question. Uh, I factor in three and a half minutes per item and I spa factor in 10 minutes for the special appeal. So if we had eight items, okay, and we multiplied that by three and a half, we'd come up with, uh, I think that's 30, is that 20 minutes or 30 minutes? That's, uh, that's 32 minutes. 30, well, four minutes. No, 30, be, that's like 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's like between yeah, it 30, 30 minutes plus 10 minutes is 40 minutes. So if you did, if you were, if you were going to donate, if you were going to give 10, 40 minutes of your fundraise of that night, then you should have eight items in your in your live auction. So Scott and I are really good at math. That, <laughs> write that down at three and a half minutes per item and 10 minutes for the special appeal. That's how right. I advise people. The the biggest thing I I'd like to stress here is you just you just never really you never want the live auction and, and fun and need to go over an hour because then you're you're getting towards the edge of people's uh, attention spans you know if or n by maximum at, you know, ninety minutes uh, but uh, events I've been to where it goes beyond that it's just it's just too much so it's more about timing than it has to do with the number of items it has to do with the skill of your auctioneer how quickly they can uh, sell each item if it's someone who takes a little bit longer then you want to have fewer right. Um, but obviously the more items that you can pack into that hour uh, that will still sell, the better. Right, but you also have to have an entertainment component in there as well. I can sell items at a commercial auction and I can sell 100 items an hour. But right. if it's a fundraising event, it's going to be 20 items an hour or maybe even 17 or 18. And I was just consulting this morning for a big wine auction. Now this takes place in the afternoon, uh, but we're going to have 40 items in the auction. 40. That's a wow. lot. And it's going to, uh, the way I factored it out, it's going to end up taking three hours to do. But wow. it is an afternoon event. You could never get away from, with that at night, generally speaking. Right. It depends on the venue. If you're kind of in an outdoor, yeah. you know, barbecue type, you know, thing, it's totally different than a, you know, very concert. There's even a cocktail hour. Uh, I've seen cocktail hour events that they'll sell four, four items, right, in 30, in 30 minutes. So uh, Absolutely. And it, it totally depends, too. Is, is the uh, auction the entertainment for the night? Or right. you know, or do you have, or is it just one more component? So, great. And then, real quick, just to remind folks, and what happens if you don't have enough? Because the the cardinal sin would be to not have enough items. You have everyone's attention there, and uh, you have an hour to fill, but you only have you only successfully secured four items, right? Well, you need maybe like. Eight to ten to to really fill out that hour and and generate the kind of revenue that you're expecting from your live auction because it can't it is one of the biggest uh, revenue generators and that's really where Winspire comes in. We do not want to replace your live auction items. Uh, we do not want to replace your procurement efforts. We are we are in existence to supplement your procurement efforts. So to round out that live auction offering so that if you don't have enough, uh, you can come to us, procure those no risk auction items, and and put those really whiz bang Napa Valley Hamilton Broadway. Cuba, uh, really, really cool uh, items in your auction, and uh, Scott, Scott, you know, does does a lot to, to really help sell those as well. Well, and I will tell you that the real key word there is quality, because if your item isn't quality, I don't care if you have t t ten of them to round out your auction. If they're not quality, you're missing the boat. You have to, you need quality, and that's one thing that Winspire always brings to the table. For instance, if your event has a Mardi Gras theme and you don't have a trip to New Orleans. What are you doing? You've right. got to have a trip to New Orleans <laughs> if you, uh, you know, if you're going to have a Mardi Gras theme. Well, how are you going to put that together? The best thing right. to do? Call Windspire. Totally. Yeah, what we pride ourselves on is taking care of your winning bidders. Uh, you know, we make sure every single one of them is is really well taken care of, so that because we want them to come back and 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 buy a Windspire trip year after year, and in in the process, you know, raise money for you. So we're in the business of taking care of your winning bidders, sending them on those trips, and and uh, providing you with with incredible auction items. So and not to um, sound like and not to sound like a salesman for Windspire here, but yes, the concierge service is so critical because when we say when the auctioneer says sold. You collect the money. The only thing you should ever hear from the from your buyer, what as a charity, is what a great time they had on the trip. You do not want your phone ringing saying, "Hey, we're thinking about going May the 10th. Can you set that up for us?" You don't do that. Winspire does that, and right. that's very important to not-for-profit organizations because you need to be focused on what you do best, which is helping make the, the lives of others become better. 
you don't need to be in the consignment business. Windspire's in the consignment business, therefore that's why I like Windspire. Yeah, you don't need to be a travel agent. You should be organizing your next event, right? You don't want to be dealing with yeah. uh, everything that comes along with, with travel because it is a full-time job. I, I can tell you our, our ops team is, is always busy uh, making sure folks are having a great time on those trips. So um, with that, please get in touch with us. If you have an auction coming up and you uh, have more questions about using consignment travel in your auction, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, with that, I, I do want to thank you, Scott, so much, as always, for coming on and sharing your knowledge. I know this won't be the last time we hear from you. We, there was actually so much knowledge that, uh, that was just spilling out. We actually had to cut this presentation short. Obviously, we've already gone over the, the hour's time, but I'm sure there will be another one in the future here. So thank you so much, Scott, for, for coming out. My pleasure. And you know what I'd like to offer, and maybe you can do it there, but people, I love to help people, and this is what I do. I'm a full-time fundraising auctioneer. So... I'm going to give to three three people. If you'll enter, e email me and make your best pitch for why I should give you a free 30-minute consultation. I mean, no strings attached whatsoever. It's free. I'm happy to help. But to make it interesting, give me a pitch on why why I should help you, and I will award that to three listeners today. Awesome. Thank you for that, Scott. And uh, as I said, check us out at winspireme.com about including no risk travel in your auction. If you haven't subscribed to our blog, Winspire News, it's a fabulous resource for uh, you know all about organizing better events. Uh, we come out with one to two posts per week. Uh, our, our fundraising editor, Sumi Lau, is incredible. She's very knowledgeable on, on everything to do with event fundraising. And, and we actually give away a $1,000 tra travel package uh, every quarter to one blog subscriber. Our next drawing is coming up on January 1st. So uh, visit u.winspireme.com backslash subscribe, or you can just Google subscribe to Winspire News or just Google Winspire News. Uh, we have that donation giveaway going. Uh, I also like to uh, tell people that we have a, a podcast that we've done. Uh, we've interviewed Scott a couple times on there. It's called Events with Benefits. Uh, my colleagues Renee Zhao and Dan Danny Hooper, uh, and we talk all about event fundraising. It's it's a fabulous podcast. Uh, so definitely check that out wherever you get your uh, podcast. And with that, um, we're going to open it up with questions. All right. Well, and thank everybody for still being on the line. I know we went a little, bit, a little bit long, but as you can tell, Ann and I are very passionate about fundraising events that feature fundraising auctions. So uh, I'm glad you're still with us, and I hope it's been a benefit. Awesome. That's great. We actually got a, a, some great questions. If you have a question that uh, um, wasn't answered during this webinar, please enter it now. We'll definitely get to it. Um, got a few here from Tess, uh, some great questions from her. Scott, when is the best time to do a fund a need? Uh, it depends upon the it, it depends upon the event, but tr most of the time, it's pr just prior to your live auction. You've gotten the people, and that's going to be held uh, while dinner has been served. Then start your program, and while everybody's nice and calm, that's the time to to do the special appeal. I don't. I used to do it in the middle of the auction. Um, I don't do it anymore because we we take the energy level up, then we take the energy level down for the special appeal to get people to listen. Then we try to get it back up again, and I find it much more effective and efficient to do it. Early. I've also done it as early as salad course. Do the special appeal, serve, serve the salads, do the special appeal, serve the dinner, serve the entree, then do the live auction. Uh, if you're sitting back there shaking your head saying, no, we always do it at the end, because if someone doesn't buy a live auction item, they'll uh, give more in the special appeal. I'm telling you, not going to happen. National studies have been done through all my peer groups, and we will all tell you that does not work. All it does is that you people are less motivated, we're on the wrong side of the alcohol bell curve, and it just doesn't hold water. And so, regardless of where you do it, you just always want to make sure that you have an emotional appeal right before you do it, right? Whether it's a yeah. short 60 second video or a, a story from a benefactor, uh, you know, benefactor getting up, uh, you know, giving a little speech. Make sure it's short and quick. Get that yeah. get that oxytocin going in the brain where people are just inspired, feeling great. Their heart is fluttering. That is the time that you want to start the fun and need. Absolutely. Talk about strategic. My goodness, the special appeal is the most strategic time of the whole night. Yeah. 
That was a great one, Tess. Another one from Tess. Uh, what is the ideal ratio of revenue sources, auction, tickets, sponsorships, etc.? <laughs> all you can get. <laughs> we all just keep there telling them that they have to think strategically, though. Yeah, uh, but be strategic on what what you can do. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule there, um, but look and see what you can do to create different levels of sponsorships and then do the best that you can with it. And I don't think sponsorships and ticket sales necessarily go hand in hand, although lots of times sponsorships give people uh, tickets. Right. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you another strategic thing to do is where you seat people. And we could probably ought to save that for another webinar. But, uh, you know, make sure that the money – don't let people sit where they want. Sit people – where that the money is closest to the auctioneer and works its way out to the fringes. Seating is really important. De definitely um, test the you know sponsorships, the auction, the auction, and then um, the special appeal are, are should be your biggest three revenue earners. And as, as Scott mentioned, ticket sales should ideally cover the cost of the of hosting the event, the venue, the catering, etc. So that you know everything above that at very least, right, is going directly to the cause. So um, you know, those are your biggest three revenue owners. The silent auction, other revenue generators, raffle, uh, those are gonna kinda bring up uh, bring up the rest of uh, you know, they're each gonna serve a small part, but the biggest three are are, are those that I mentioned. Yeah, and if I could just jump in one more time and reiterate ticket sales, if you're a first time event price the tickets where they ought to be. Don't price them low because that's the hardest tradition to break is when you raise ticket prices. People think you're trying to rip them off when really all you're trying to do is pay the cost and you subsidize their tickets. People don't realize that. And Actually, to that end, um, Tess had another third question um, uh, about tickets. What is your thought on early bird pricing or two for lesser cost pricing? I don't I, – I don't – particularly like that. I think you're penalizing the single person. If someone's buying a single ticket, I think they might feel somewhat slighted because of the single ticket. Um, and early bird pricing, I think the, I think what you want to do is position your event so that people want to buy the tickets and they better hurry up and buy them or they're going to be sold out. I'm not a fan of the early bird pricing because to tell you, all you did was when you gave me that deadline is they forced me to buy my ticket earlier, and now all of a sudden I feel like I'm being punished because I didn't buy my ticket earlier. So I'm not a fan of it, but there might be other people who have different schools of thought on that. The other thing we don't want to have, of course, is that people don't buy their tickets until two days before the event. We can't plan for them. So um, just, Good. yeah. I'm not uh, sure I answered your question, Tess. I'm sorry. Well, I no, I think I think that you did basically. You said no. Uh, you don't typically, you know, do the the, you know, the the price savings on the tickets uh, just because it is so important for them to, uh, you know, cover the cost of the event. But uh, thank you so much, Tess, for those those questions there. Um, Casey Parr, uh, can you give suggestions regarding your timeline when the donors don't follow it? You give deadlines, you make contacts. Uh, when do you move on? Especially if this is a major donor. <laughs> That I think you have to do that on a case by case basis, and but you know we you tend to train your donors, and you don't you never want to be mean, uh, but you tend to train your donors and just friendly follow ups uh, would be my recommendation and follow up with a reason. We need to know because we're going to print with the book on Thursday. Well, they're going to want their name in the book, uh, you know, and give them compelling reasons to. Uh, to hurry up. They're in the driver's seat, but you know they can't be in the driver's seat for forever either. So uh, give them compelling reasons for why your deadlines are what they are. That sure. would be my that would be my thought. But if they're a big donor, you know, we never want to run the risk of ticking off a big donor either. So case, um, oh, go ahead. Case by case basis. All right, Casey had a follow-up question too. Scott, why don't you like raffles? I don't like raffles because I feel Gosh, I know I'm stepping on toes here. I apologize. I feel that raffles tend to cheapen the event. Now, of course, it depends upon the event, but I don't want people buying just raffle tickets, and then um, after they buy the raffle ticket, they feel like they've supported the charity because the raffle tickets aren't going to be that much money for the most part. 
Plus, you know, we need to sell all the raffle tickets, right? Uh, and that puts a little extra pressure. I also find that raffle ticket sales occur early in the event. When you first walk in the door, boom, you're inundated with people trying to sell you raffle tickets. Well, they're being overzealous because they want to get their job accomplished and they want to feel good about it. But did we get a nickel from them when we should have been getting a dollar from them? So I think raffles just kind of tend to, ch to cheapen the event in, in many cases. In many That's cases. It. Yeah, I mean, I think raffles are definitely an effective fundraising tool. They don't have to happen at the event um, either. I mean, raffles can be an extremely effective tool outside of the event. They're a perfect fundraising uh, tool when you don't even have an event. I know we do a lot of, of, of uh, winner's choice raffles where, you know, you can reserve three or more experiences from us uh, and you offer them all so that the winner it's, gets to choose from the three experiences when they win the raffle. Yep. Uh, and so it provides a much, you know, broader prize for to appeal to a wider audience and we've, we've had you know nonprofits raise over ten thousand dollars in an off season you know during the summer um, uh, especially uh, you know running that raffle is, is all you have to do is sell you know enough tickets uh, to cover the cost of the package and then some and, and you you've gone and done a great return so uh, for more information on that you can go and just uh, if you google winner's choice raffle or fun you can actually just google fundraising raffle there's a great blog post out there where we talk all about doing an, an off-season uh, raffle well and you know what in Japan I think that's fine the problem I the, the reason that I don't like raffle tickets the night of the event is that we've got them we've got them captured Let's not nickel and dime them. Let's you know. Let's t let's get their dollar, not nickel and dime them. And and raffles can sometimes be felt, you know, as the donor, it, it can feel like you're being nickel and dime, and nobody wants to be nickel and dimed. You know, they they don't want to do that. This is a great question from. Thank you for that, Casey. Uh, this is a great question from Kathy Lawson. Uh, what's the best way to introduce attendees to a live auction when you've never had one at your event before? <laughs> uh, well, I think you. Uh, I, I. Well, let's see. It's a great I'm, question. <laughs> it is a good question. It kind of took me back for a moment. Um, I don't know that you necessarily want to sell just a few items, but that's one way of introducing it. Let's say you would sell four or five items and see how how it feels and how it goes. Um, but I think you just say you're going to have a live auction. Most people get very excited about auctions. They're accustomed to auctions. Um, but if you were worried about whether you should or whether you shouldn't, then sell three or four items as opposed to selling, you know, eight or ten. Right. And I, one important thing about, you know, if you're doing it for the first time is live auctions are perfect for promoting the event, right? Whereas silent auction items are not as, you know, as exciting, um, live auction is your opportunity to get some really wow, incredible, you know, items donated from your local community like that ultimate date night or, you know, if you get a, you know, no risk package from, from Winspire, it's something where you can use it to promote the event. Hey, we're going to be offering tickets to Hamilton in New York City as part of our, you know, Broadway theme event, or we're going to be offering a trip for an incredible trip for a lifetime to Napa Valley. Use that in your email correspondence or in your, you know, direct mailers or uh, whatever communication that you're sending out. Uh, the live auction can be a great tool for promoting the event. Absolutely, and one thing's for sure, if you're going to have a live auction, you certainly should have a special appeal. You know, that's where everybody has an opportunity to give, and you should certainly do the fund to need special appeal as part of the live auction. Thank you for that, Kathy. This one's from Jeanette Wilson. How would you best plan for a live auction at an event where the guests are not stationary, i.e. several rooms, cocktail party style? <laughs> Oh boy, that is a real good question, and I think I've mastered it. I just got called in to do an event out in Vegas where I wasn't the auctioneer, but they needed me for my expertise on how to do just what you're doing. Um, one of the things is you have to make sure that the time you're going to have the live auction is duly noted. Uh, I'm a big fan of high-top cocktail. First of all, I would recommend not doing it this way. However, if you're stuck with doing it this way, this is what you should do. You should have high top cocktail tables spread out around the room, not just right on the stage. Uh, I would do auction in the round where your, the speaker or the auctioneer is going to be elevated about 18 inches up. Um, and they can be on like a six by six stage, something that small. Um, 
you have screens up around the room and you gather the people in and the people that are interested in the live auction will come by and the people who have no interest they'll probably stay in the other rooms well that's okay because they're not going to be bidding on anything anyway but you want to make sure that you have signage up that the live auction is going to start at 745 and then people know to come in you make some announcements and then the auctioneer gets up and the auction chant kind of goes around and that's how I would do it that's how I would that's how I would do it is it better to divide and conquer as I call it and then have a seated dinner yes it certainly is however if you've got an event that that doesn't lend itself to that then I would I would do the auction in the round and have people gather around it's a great answer Thank you for that, Jeanette. I've got a couple of and, and don't and I wouldn't put it in the center of the you know, depending upon how the room configuration is, pick your bigger room and you know, put it away from so that people do have a reason, especially if people are gonna talk a lot. Let those people talk a lot away from the auction. Let them talk away from the auction. That's great. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Jeanette. We got a similar question here from Marjorie and then Diane Barney. Uh, and this is great. It's, you're, you're starting to think like a business, which is awesome. What is the appropriate revenue to expense ratio? Or another way, like what is the typical ROI or for an event? Boy, oh boy. Totally. It's a great question, and you're thinking the right way. However, it's, uh, it's challenging. Uh, to come up with an appropriate amount because if you have a hundred thousand dollar event or a two hundred thousand and I'm just throwing out numbers here folks it could be ten thousand versus twenty thousand if you have a hundred thousand dollar event versus a two hundred thousand dollar event does it cost twice as much to have a two hundred thousand dollar event as it did a hundred thousand dollar event no. no it did not okay so it's impossible to come up with a good percentage there at least the way that I'm looking at it and remember what we're really wanting to do is take that hundred thousand dollar event or ten thousand dollar event and position it so it becomes a twenty thousand dollar event or a two hundred thousand dollar event you can't just put uh, items on a uh, spreadsheet and have it make sense for instance a case in point return on investment you know my services they're not inexpensive when you look at them on a spreadsheet the free auctioneer you can put down a big zero right there's no cost well is that true or not true because the amount of money they leave on the table is the money they actually cost the amount of money that they didn't leave on the table but enhanced that's the money additional revenue that you brought in so don't be afraid to hire the professional to come in and run your help you run your event. If they don't, if I don't pay for myself multiple multiple times over during the fundraising auction, I'm going to be having a long hard talk with me on my way home that night. That just doesn't happen. So be careful not to get too tied up on the spreadsheet of what your percentages were. Be more focused on what you were able to do. And did you get all the money out of the room? And did we position ourselves to be even in a better position uh, next year? I could go on forever telling you stories about when I got brought into an event, we were at X, and now we're at four times that amount, or even way higher than that. But always position your event so it's for growth. And don't get tied up, especially that first year. Establish a good fundraising event. Don't just focus on the money. The money's important, no question about it. But focus on having an event that has sustainability and has the ability to grow because that's what's going to help your organization the most in the long run. That was a great answer. I got nothing to add to that. Awesome. Um, real quick, Shelly Mahan. Thanks for those questions, Marjorie and uh, Diane. Shelly Mahan, um, she just wanted to add that she gives people something. She's given something to people for registering early instead of using the early bird special. Um, maybe maybe the, those some of those donations that you're not going to put on the silent auction table, uh, you can have little prizes for people who register early. I think that's a great suggestion. I like um, that idea. You know, that's hey, that's, it, it incentivizes people. I like that idea. I've never done it. I like the idea. Mar uh, thanks for that, Shelley. Marjorie again um, has a question about hard copy programs. Are they suggested to further explain larger ticket live auction items? Oh my goodness, yes. 
Yes, 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 yes. Can you tell I'm passionate about this? Don't just put a PowerPoint screen up on the, you know, up on a PowerPoint slide up on the screen and expect people to be able to read it, see it, understand it, and be there. Let people study the program. Get the program out to people early. Uh, put it in large enough print that people are able to read it. I see people trying to save printing costs by putting like four items, you know, two, two items per page in a book. Give it one item per page in the book. Okay. Make sure that any disclaimers that you have not valid during holidays is right there and in bold print, so that later on, when the person tries to book it between Thanksgiving and uh, or between Christmas and New Year's that week, they're like, oh, "You didn't tell me." It's like, "Yes, we did. It's right there in the book." Oh, they've got no leg to stand on. But yeah, treat those live auction packages with the care and respect that they need. Uh, yes, you need to have them on the PowerPoint slide, but you certainly need to have them in print format so that people can see them and read them. And that book is also a great place to recognize your sponsors. That's great. Yeah, and we actually we have a free auction catalog template that um, that you can download if you just uh, you can go to our, our resources page at winspireme.com uh, or you can just Google uh, you know Winspire auction catalog. It'll take you right to the page, and you know we it's a word template that you can use and manipulate um, images and and text to to really create that 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 full page auction catalog. I think we actually have a few different versions. Um, uh, of it that you can uh, definitely check out, and I'll send that in an email along with the recording as well. Um, and oh, yeah. and here's a, I'm go sorry, Ian. and no, here and here's a trick: if you've got 200 buying units coming to your auction, how many programs should you print? Um, that's a good question. 100, 150. You got 200 buying units coming. You 200? need to print 400. I would just go ahead and do 450 or 500 copies. Wow. And you're like, Scott, what are you talking about? That's too much work. We could save money on printing. I want one copy to go to the buying unit's home. I do not wow. expect that person to bring that with them the night of the event. Then, night of the event, the catalog is right there on their table so that they can uh, peruse the items the night of. All those catalogs will be open the night of, and they'll be looking, and they'll be pointing, and they'll be trying to figure out what items they should buy, who they should buy them for. It creates conversation, and all the information is there. And how bullet points are way better than uh, flowery experience. Escape to the wandering hills of North Carolina where you'll yeah, be it. dying in, no, three-bedroom, yeah. two-bath, you know, yep. give them the details and bullet point so they can easily see it because when the when the rubber hits the road is when the auction is going on. And they're like, How many people is this for? Three bedroom, two bath. That means two couples. Right. 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 No, that's so that's don't like to share bathrooms. And you're gonna go insane if you try to write the we trust me, we do the experience def, uh, you know, descriptions here and uh, it takes a lot of work to put that stuff together. So do yourself a favor, keep it simple. You know, just use bullets, display those blackouts, and uh, and yeah, and uh, check out check out our free auction catalog. Uh, Tess had a real. She actually just asked this question. Tess, uh, love all your questions coming in. By the way, uh, how far in advance should you send the program to guests? Ha! Another great question. Generally speaking, I'm I'm a fan of 21 days, so that's three weeks. I don't want to send it so early that people put it aside. But I want to send it early enough that people hopefully will leave it on their coffee table so that everybody has a chance to look at it when they're nice and sober and they can make good decisions. So I'm going to say 21 days. If it were 14 days, it wouldn't be a horrible thing. And you know, if you send it the week of the event, you're probably late. And don't forget, you can also use a lot of social media, but I would definitely have all those in a catalog, mail to the home. 14 and days. 21 days is better. I think that's great. And you're conditioning the bidders to actually bid on those items. They're, they're actually having the conversation before they walk through the front door, right, which is really, really Absolutely. important. 
and and Tess just asked too about should you include silent auctions in the program? I would say absolutely not because you're going to go crazy trying to pick <laughs> which ones to put in there. But if you only have you know five to ten to twelve live auction items, that is totally manageable, and and you can spend the yeah. time to really make it a, a beautiful program um, and make it something people are going to want to look at and get excited about. Uh, don't waste your time you know promoting silent yeah. auctions in that program. That's what social media is for. If if even that, right? The silent auction is really yeah. just for something for people to do uh, while they're there. Take, you know, use the the perceived value of the live auction items to to promote the event in the program on silent on uh, social media, so people know what they're going to be ready to bid on when they get there. Yeah, I've seen it done where people put the silent auction items in, but of course they had to put an addendum in. Uh, but I will tell you, if you put silent auction items into your live auction book, you should be you should be given a stipend for therapy or a divorce attorney because you're going to need one of the two. It's it's too overwhelming. It is way too overwhelming. All right, and with that, Kelsey Parr, I'm going to reach out to you directly and uh, give you some answers here. Um, but we are at 11:30, which is uh, more than enough. We've taken more than enough of your guys' time out there. Um, but hopefully, we answer most of your questions. Um, for those that we didn't, we're going to answer, reach out to you directly. Um, I once again want to thank Scott Robertson. Thank you so much for coming out and sharing your knowledge. This is really valuable, not only for me, but I think for everyone involved. So, um, thank you very much. My pleasure. And uh, for those people that are still listening, you know, I mean, I travel. I, you know, I'm in California on a regular basis. My headquarters is in Florida, but I go all over the country conducting fundraising auctions. So if you think I could be a benefit, reach out to me and uh, let's see if we have time on the calendar. I'd love to help if I can. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you all out there for joining us here today. Um, stay tuned for more free webinars coming up very soon. Take care, folks. Thank you, Ann.